Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today again uh, for another seminar of the Politics of Liberation series. Today, we've got the great pleasure and honor to have with us Yanis Hamilakis. I uh, guess he doesn't need much introduction uh, to the Greek public. Uh, he's going to talk to us about material memory and the politics of freedom. As usual, we have a talk which will last around an hour, uh, and then the floor is yours to ask questions and interrogate Yanis on his research <laughs> and on all the interesting things he's gonna tell us today. Yanis, thank you very much, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Rosa, thank you, Giorgo, and um, thank you, Phoebe, and thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. Um, it's great to talk here, it's great to have the chance to communicate some thoughts and ideas with um, a different audience, different from the usual archaeological or other audience that I, I, I communicate with. I am grateful for the invitation to deliver this lecture at the Athens office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, an institution which has done much in recent years to promote emancipatory projects and connect the struggles and the associated debates in Greece with much global discussion. I will speak from my disciplinary position and identity, that of an archeologist, but one that has confronted the ontological, the epistemic, and the political underpinnings of that discipline. It will become clear from what is to follow that this disciplinary identity, the identity of the archeologist, is one that I carry with much ambivalence. To put it differently, um, I refuse to identify with the colonial and the nationalist heritage of archaeology, although I do recognize that such a heritage is part of the received inheritance, and as such, it will need to be um, carefully and critically scrutinized. At the same time, I strive to redefine, to reconstitute archaeology, or other archaeologies in the plural. Not so much as a profession or academic discipline, but rather as a sensibility, as a set of relationships, as a strategy of mediation. More on that in a minute, but before that, I wanted to say a word on my title. Material memory and the politics of freedom are the two key phrases, as you can see. Material memory because archaeology is about materiality, while memory in its collective and social meaning has been a key concept in thinking about time and history in more concrete experiential terms. I consider material memory a useful category when talking about things of various times or from various times or what archaeologists often describe as archaeological traces, archaeological remains, archaeological evidence, and so on. And each, each term has different connotations, but that's another discussion. At the same time, material memory is a more expansive term and includes the embodied memories created in human interactions and performances even when these do not necessarily leave recognizable material traces. So it can be memories um, embedded or embodied in our own flesh that can be kind of uh, recollected or mobilized in different occasions. Material memory relies on materiality to be produced and activated, but at the same time, it's about the dialectic and often the tension between materiality and immateriality. While material memory will be a key concept for today, a reconfigured understanding of other concepts such as traces and especially remains held enormous potential uh, for interpretation and for political discussion. Some parts of my discussion today is going to be about practices the constitution and the reconstitution of archaeology, while other parts will be about material memories and material remains. Both archaeology as a process and an apparatus and material memories will need to be examined in tandem. Since they produce each other, they are mutually constituted 
especially as archaeological traces and archaeological evidence. As for the politics of freedom, it is a note to the title of this lecture series, but at the same time, it will be clear that my sense of freedom is far removed from the liberal, or even neoliberal, and more so the individualistic understanding of freedom. My politics of freedom is rather the collective politics of emancipation. Archaeology is an unlikely candidate for the politics of liberation, you would say. I'm sure many of you thought of archaeology as something very conservative, and I think you would be correct. The most likely images it conjures up are those of the empirical, if not empiricist, research and adventurist Indiana Jones type of um, endeavors, as well as the commodified antiquities in the service of capitalism and the heritage industry. But we have enough critical, historiographic, ethnographic, and other studies by now to show that archaeology is far from an innocent, thrilling pursuit of discovery. It has been rather, and to a large extent, an apparatus of colonial, communal, and racialized capitalist modernity. I will give you a few examples of this um, rather grand statement below. If I'm correct then, and I think there is enough evidence to support this claim, both in this country and globally, then the question is what to do about it, or what to do about archaeology. Uh, in 2020, the journal American Anthropologist, which is the main venue, the main journal of the American Anthropological Association, the largest association of anthropologists in the world with 700,000 uh, members, published a paper by Ryan Cecil Jobson with the title, The Case of Letting Anthropology Burn, an article which caused much debate. It took as its starting point and as an inspiration the American Anthropological Association meetings in San Jose, San Jose in California in 2018, a meeting that which also I attended. I recall the corporate hotel environment in which that meeting was held. That's the norm, unfortunately. Meeting for which we had to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars to attend. But more than that, I recall the strong smells of burning from the wildfires of Northern California, smell that you could not miss the moment you stepped outside the hotel environment. Inspired by that great Marxist whom we lost recently, Mike Davis, the author of this paper wanted to remind us of the current moment of climate catastrophe, which forms the background to our thinking and to conference going, including the conference in California. But he also called us um, uh, to abandon the liberal assu assumptions of anthropology, the assumptions of a universal subject. He did not advocate for anthropology to be led to burn, after all, but rather to be reconfigured, and I quote, in the service of the political projects of repatriation, repair, and abolition. Like him, I'm not advocating for archaeology to be burned, to be ditched, but to be reconfigured and reinvented. Now, I almost said to be decolonized. Decolonization is a word of the moment, as we know, not only in archaeology, but everywhere in academia. And we also used it um, as a subtitle in the book that we published with a colleague, Rafi Greenberg, recently, Archaeology, Nation, Race, the title, but in the subtitle, Confronting the Past, Decolonizing the Future in Greece and Israel. But decolonization is not a metaphor. Decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is obviously a program of complete disorder and this is a quotation from Franz Fanon. And this was in 1963, long before the term decolonization uh, was popular or became popular. So decolonization will have to be both broad and specific at the same time, countering the ideological but also the material colonizing forces, 
including race, nation, and capital. It's not only about specific countries, that is, the ex-colonies or the countries who have been formally colonized um, by the empires of the global north. It concerns the whole world, and it's about coloniality, not colonialism, coloniality, as both an epistemic and a material political project grounded on hierarchies of racialization as well as extraction and appropriation. In academia, it's important to see decolonization work as one facet of the global decolonizing movement, which gained new vitality and force during the 2020 global anti-racist uprising. We can gain inspiration, theoretical and methodological insights, as well as encouragement and support from that movement. Interestingly, and crucially for us, archaeologists or specialists of material heritage, and for our discussion today, this anti-racist movement has identified statues, monuments, and sites of commemoration as a key focal point, and as localities that embody and perpetuate white supremacy. And this is one of the key locales in this um, global and racist movement, in this case in the US, in Virginia, and Richmond, with a key statue that became the focus and was toppled after demonstrations. So you can now see only the pedestal and not the statue itself, the statue of a, 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 a major general from the Civil War. The activists and the publics who have been protesting around and modifying such sites recognize the histories of forgetting that underpin their making. They can see clearly how monuments have been often weaponized in the ongoing battles around race and nation. Archaeology often identifies with conservation and preservation, but it's well known that archaeology also destroys. Archaeology destroys since it selects its object, its period of study, and the category of material traces to focus upon, and at the same time, destroys everything else in the process of pursuing these selected material traces, and this despite legislation that often pretends to preserve everything. At other times, it destroys the buildings, the artifacts, or the traces that are considered polluting barbarian, or unsuitable for sacred national locales. And of course, um, I have written a lot, and other colleagues have, uh, on the case of the Athenian Acropolis, as a well-known example of a locale where those processes of destruction happened, following its elevation to the supreme and to the most sacred specimen of Western civilization and its ancestral myths, the material embodiment of the future interior of the West, its transformation into a purified and sanitized archaeological site followed. As it's well known by now, I hope it is, the Bavarian and other German architects and archaeologists who came with King Otto in the 1830s made the start in this process of purification and sacralization, and the Greek archaeologists and architects followed suit modifying the earlier strategies of purification and cleansing along the way. Demolition and destruction were the key devices here, clearing away what was considered remnants of barbarity. Restoration, or rather rebuilding, followed, rebuilding of the classical mo uh, monuments, the classical temples. Despite their proclaimed admiration of the classical mir miracle of the fifth century BC, however, they were not recreating the ancient classical material past with its polychromy, its visceral rituals and practices, its sacrifices, and the symposia, and also the echoes of, multi, of a multicultural Mediterranean. <laughs> Through demolition, purification, and rebuilding, what these archaeologists, architects, and scholars were doing, and still continue to do, as we know, was to produce new material memories for the colonial and racialized modernity of whiteness. This is what has been happening. It's not about re restoring or recreating the fifth century. It's about producing a monument of racialized and white modernity. <laughs> 
Now, when Confederate monuments in the US and statues of slave owners in the UK started falling down, coming down, some critics, including some archeologists, saw in these acts practices of iconoclasm at best and purification and erasure of historical memory at worst. Three years ago, in an article I wrote for the Los Angeles Review of Books, I argued, along with others, that this belief is fundamentally wrong. Take the Confederate monuments in the United States, for example. Most of them were created long after the end of the American Civil War. And here you have a graph that shows when these monuments were created. As you can see, there is a big a peak on those monuments, and that was when, um, when there was mobilization amongst African Americans, when the Association for the Advancement of Colored People, AACP, was founded, uh, when there was clearly a, a sense amongst the white majority that the African Americans were organizing. That's when those kind of monuments were built. You can see the peak here, right? The Civil War is here, so many, many decades later, in the 1900s, around the turn of the century, is when we see these monuments. There is a second peak, however, and that's, that's, in the, um, that's in the 60s, that's here, the civil rights movement. So the two main chronological points when there is a huge African-American mobilization are the moments when we see also these statues being erected. It is clear then that these statues were created and were erected as racist weapons in an ongoing struggle, and it is an ongoing struggle, not as historical landmarks to commemorate the Civil War, not as representations, nor as commemorative acts. These monuments will only become truly historical once they cease to be heritage weapons dominating public space. Now, in the case of the Acropolis and elsewhere, they intention of the state and its apparatuses, including archeologists and art historians, has been to reshape the monumental landscape in order to suit a national and colonial dream, one based on homogeneity and national and Western superiority. Any material out of place, be it monuments or non-classical eras or traces of the Ottoman period that invoke the Oriental other had to be erased. On the contrary, in the case of the um, the recent statue movement or the African-American battle against these statues, it's neither states nor establishment forces, but popular movements that have taken the initiative to remove these Confederate and slaver statues today. And their intentions are the opposite from that of the states or uh, establishment organizations to counter superiority, white superiority and homogenization. The campaigners and activists know, know only too well that such a monumental panoptic landscape is not about remembering, it is about forgetting. Recall the, um, the high the pedestals and the statues and think of the panopticism of that statue in a public space, in a public landscape. It is about erasing the brutal violence upon which such order sits. The toppling of these statues was not a symbolic killing of the men, of the men, always men depicted, but rather an attempt to mobilize their figures in the service of a power, powerful political performance. And the sense of performance was, was, was key in these mobilizations. The demonstrations and gatherings around these statues constituted public assemblies, but they also stages, they were produced stages for political rituals of emancipation. These performances aimed at redirecting our sensorial attention to the unfinished histories that should haunt us all, inviting us at the same time to embrace an ontology of life that is guided by such, is guided by such haunting. And I have lots to say on the concept of haunting later uh, in the talk. As for the objects themselves, these statues, we should come to recognize that such mobilization, including their defacement, damage, or partial destruction, is another chapter in their cultural biography. It adds to their significance as material entities. The protesters' acts were not pure destruction, but creative reconductualization, 
um, the slaver Colston statue, um, which was thrown into the Bristol Harbor in the UK at the same time as in the US, we just, you had the toppling of the um, Confederate monuments, was later retrieved by archeologists, by, um, by specialists of heritage from the Bristol City Council. And it was examined as a historical material object. Conservators carefully preserved the graffiti and the paint that was left by protesters. It then resurfaced not in a public square, not upon a high pedestal, but in an exhibition space where its history, including its recent dive into the harbor, was examined, was re-examined close up by visitors. It is on its way to a museum for a permanent exhibition. It is now treated as a contested historical artifact, speaking not only of the British imperial legacy and of the slave trade, but also of the attempts to whitewash this legacy of slavery in the name of philanthropy. So Colston was also a public philanthropist in Britain, so he uh, donated uh, money into various causes. The movement over the statues was part of a global insurrection that has already achieved significant gains in policy as well as in social perception. The participants in these movements are much better informed and their diverse affective actions and political theater much more nuanced than many of our rational responses, our responses to specialists, archaeologists and others um, have been or are. Now, in the Archaeology, Nation, and Race book I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, I'm suggesting that the decolonial process starts with a reflexive moment, a moment of realizing that you have been colonized, that everything you, you do within archaeology or within any other discipline operating within a specific modernist regime, a specific national and con colonial frame, is part of a long process of colonizing ideas, knowledge, but also colonizing institutions and colonizing practices. And we have to remember that the broader regime of modernist archaeology has been shaped by specific ideas about the body and about time and experience. It is also structured around domineering binaries such as subject and object, nature and culture, or even past versus present, the whole kind of um, uh, foundational logic of archaeology is the separation between past and present. Now, these binaries have colonized our imagination and shaped our thoughts and actions. Modernist archaeologists, for example, have bought into the notions of temporal linearity, exemplified by our stratigraphic sequences. And are accustomed, we are accustomed to separate past and present, a dichotomy with important consequences on how we see our role, our relationship with communities today, but also how we tell stories about what we call the past. I put it to you that the building of a new, openly political, radical, and nomadic archaeology or archaeologies will need to be grounded not to one but on three epistemic, ontological, and political paradigm shifts, which are closely linked. Let me outline them very briefly. The first epistemic paradigmatic shift has to do with the chronopolitics of archaeology. By that I mean the way we perceive time, our sense of temporality, which is laden with political effects. We are grounded, as I just mentioned, on the separation between past and present and on linear, progressive, and developmental time. This is about the slicing of time and the metaphor of temporal experience as a train journey. The Times Arrow idea, which has been, as we know by now, critiqued heavily within philosophy, in anthropology, and also in history, but also in some archaeological writings. This is the progressivist and teleological time of Western modernity, which is shared by both dominant bourgeois understandings as well as some traditional Marxist ones. Despite Benjamin's warning that instead of traveling happily in the locomotive of history, we should rather do something truly revolutionary and pull the emergency brake. We archaeologists of our people who deal with matter and with things should have been the first to ditch linearity. 
matter and body's duration, and this is a northern evocation um, um, to Bergson, to um, uh, Bergson and his Bergsonian understanding of duration and matter. It enacts different temporal moments simultaneously, not in succession. I'm not talking about diachrony or continuity here, which are both tropes which are embedded in linearity and have been also mobilized by nationalist narratives. As we know, nationalism is all about continuity. I'm talking about multi-temporality as the coexistence of different times. What we call the present is a fragile consensus, as some historians have put it, and I found that expression uh, extremely powerful. A fragile consensus. They also call it a silent clash, a silent clash. Now, it's worth thinking about the present as a silent clash. The present is always haunted by different paths, and it also entails different temporal regimes, which often clash, linearity versus, versus multi-temporality, for example, or different social groups embodying and living different temporalities. That's what I mean when um, I and others say that colonialism and colonization has not ended, that coloniality as a condition is still present, that's what I mean when I say that the current migrant movement, and which more below uh, in a minute, from the global south, the global north, embodies the return of the colonized. We are here because you have been there, is what they tell us, what they tell people in the north. We are here now in the global north because you have been where we were. The current migration movement is the latest episode in the long history of extractive colonization of the earth, starting with early modernity, as we know. People on the move, my preferred term for migrants, people on the move, embody a living history. They enact in a profound way time as coexistence and as duration. Material memories are activated through remnants, not by recalling certain pasts, as new haunting presences that cite and reactivate previous memories. But before I continue on migration, let me return to the case of the Athenian Acropolis for a moment. I have stressed time and again in my own work that despite the 200 years of cleansing and purification, the multi-temporal materiality of this locale survives here and there in fragments, in scattered remnants. I've discussed two such cases extensively in my own uh, books and articles that relate to the Ottoman Acropolis, um, the early 19th century inscription in Arabic script, you can see on, the, on your left here, uh, which was inscribed on a fragment from the Erechtheum. So you have the classical fragment that was found by the Ottoman inhabitants and rulers of the Acropolis, and they inscribed an inscription in 1805 praising the governor of Athens. It was embedded in the propylaea you know, of the entrances, you know, the main entrance of the Acropolis. And to your right, you see fragments from the Muslim tombstones from the extensive and extremely important Muslim cemetery on the western slope of the Acropolis, on which we have many, many iconographic evidence and some scattered material traces, and on which, of course, the millions of visitors of the Acropolis step upon every time now go to the site. So they step upon bones and upon remnants of the dead while they go to visit the sacred locality of modernity. The inscription was photographed first by myself and then by my collaborator, Fotis Ifandidi, several years ago as part of our other Acropolis project. Soon later, it disappeared. It used to be next to the Erechtheum. I haven't seen it for years now. Who knows where it is? Who knows when it's going to resurface and how? As for the tombstones, they are still there. You can see them as you walk up the propylaea, but caged in a metal cage, part of a rubble of assorted fragments with no signage and no attempt to direct the sight and the attention of the visitors. Uh, to them. So it's important, in, next time you go to the Acropolis, take a look. I'm, I'm sure you can find them. What kind of work do these fragments do? They do not so much recall mnemonically the Ottoman face of the Acropolis, 
They rather sight and presence materially the sense of multi-temporality, given that they are experienced today, given that we are experiencing them today. But they also embody and materialize various times. Here you see in those fragments from the geological time of the marble to the classical times, given that it's marble that was actually reworked and used in, uh, in the classical times, to the Ottoman times when it was used in a secondary use or another use like an inscription base or as tombstones, to the modern times when you see them as scattered surviving remnants of the extensive campaign for purification and cleansing. So they disrupt the linearity of modernity when you encounter them today. They remind us that the Acropolis, the Acropolis we experience today is a modern construction and that the Acropolis has also been an important Ottoman monument that has been Ottoman twice as long as has been modern Greek. Yeah, this is another point of fact that we all know but we rarely think about, okay? They are remnants that these are remnants that haunt us or should haunt us. And that's their political work. They do important political work in that haunting. Now the political effects of a perception of time based on the tradition of linearity and progressivism and on the radical separation of past and present are less well understood and discussed, but they should be discussed. Escapism is one. Insulation from what we call uh, the present is another. We archaeologists work on the past. We are insulated from the present. Being oblivious to the political impact of archaeology today is another. Refusal to appreciate the haunting potential of past processes and events, the lasting and ever-present impact of the long living histories of violence, for example, is another. So linearity and progressivism in archaeology have received serious blows in recent years, and thank heavens for that, from developments such as the archaeology of the contemporary or the archaeology of the contemporary world or archaeological ethnography. These are welcoming developments. But not all strands and all research in these areas, however, appreciate the ontological effects, the radical shift that these new directions, the archaeology of the present or the archaeology of the contemporary, entail. In removing, in effect, the archaeo from the word archaeology. It is what some colleagues have called or stressed archaeology without antiquity. Now let's think of that, archaeology without the antiquity part. Let me flesh out some of these ideas through example um, from my own work. And before I show you some examples, I want to suggest that it is the concept of remains as material memories that holds for me enormous potential both for understanding the contemporary moment and for thinking through and enacting the politics of emancipation and liberation. So remains as a political concept is something I want to propose to you, especially in this audience and in this occasion. It is this potential I will be teasing out as I will be conducting an archaeology of the present, sometimes called the archaeology of the contemporary past. Now, this is not a Foucauldian archaeology of knowledge, although elements of it are included in my own definition of archaeology. As I said in my own definition, the archaeo in archaeology is decentered and bracketed. Archaeology then becomes an expansive chronopolitical field that deals with the relationship between materiality and temporality. It is about the discourses and the practices of material things, which are not ancient or not so ancient, but by definition multi-temporal. And I'll return to that point um, in a minute. To continue along similar lines, and for those unfamiliar with it, the archaeology of the contemporary past treats the materiality of the present as if it's already past, as if it's already archaeological. So it is more about pastness, the sense of pastness, and uh, than the past itself. It defamiliarizes something we consider known and familiar. We think we know the world around us, but what if we do not actually know it? What if we treat it as something to be discovered, to be known, to be studied? That's one of the things that the archaeology of the contemporary does. It's um, at the same time using archaeological sensibility, it helps us come to terms with the textures, with the atmospheres, 
and the material and sensorial intimacy of the present. This is something that archaeologists are good at in, in focusing on the textures of things, or artifacts, uh, and material traces. As I have been trying to show today, the archaeology of the present unsettles the ontological certainties and the sense of temporality of conventional fields such as history or archaeology, although such potential is yet to be fully explored, although there are, as I said, exceptions of historians and archaeologists who take this direction. Now, I've been studying ruins and remains conventionally attributed to different chronological moments in all my life, approach them from the material, chronopolitical, or chronopoetic, sensorial point of view. In the case of the Acropolis that we saw, my study of the chronopolitics of the material imagination, of the national imagination, entailed a detailed understanding on how the sensorial immediacy and the physical qualities of things, buildings, objects, and artifacts from another time, preferably from the golden age of the nation in question, in our case, the fifth century BC, contributed to the materialization of the nation form, it's a well-known story, to its empirical grounding, giving it at the same time an intimate connection with the earth and the territory, with the soil that held the bones of the ancestors. And as we know, in many cases of Greek history, that um, national deployment of the classical past also led to its political deployment in a number of examples. This is from Macronisos, that several of you will be aware of. Um, they were known photo of uh, uh, inmates, uh, political prisoners in, in effect, building replicas of the Acropolis and then the largest scale monuments there built at the time. This is from the ASCII archives and today or a few years um, earlier as ruins. So ruins of a ruin that imitated or cited the ruin of the Acropolis. So. But um, for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about another project, um, the archaeology of the contemporary migration, based on my work on the island of Lesbos. I went there as an archaeologist, and I wanted to study the process of border crossing and migration as was happening. It entailed the materiality of border crossing, but also the materiality of detention and the materiality and sensoriality of migrant experience while living in waiting, while living um, in limbo. That's what, as we know, people in, in, in Lesbos do. Now, uh, the camp of Moria, again, well known, is a key archeological site for the project, for my project, and this is from the facade after its burning, oh, welcome to Europe, human rights graveyard. Um, and I like it. This is side by side on the facade. So I think these two um, graffiti actually speak to each other, and I, I'd like to see them together. And there is an ambivalence on what is the graveyard here? Is it Europe, the graveyard of human rights, or is it Moria, or perhaps both? After my first visit to the Camp of Moria, which was in April 2016, I wrote a brief article for the American left-wing magazine, The Nation. It was a gut reaction and an immediate response, describing the place, this place, Moria, as a future ruin, as a ruin to be. That time, it was in full operation. It was not, had not been burned yet, but I described it as a ruin. In the autumn of 2020, the place, as we know, was destroyed by fire completely. The ruin foretold caught up with its futurity. It became a ruin proper, we could say. It became again the ruin of a ruin. What would it mean to approach this context as an archaeological locale, both prior and after its destruction? My provisional response would be that it would mean witnessing and experiencing multisensoriality, its texture, and reflecting on how the interplay between materiality and temporality shaped the lives of the people who went through it. Far from entertaining any notion of identification, identification with uh, people on the move, or notion of empathy, it would mean reflecting on our own positionality, in this case, my own positionality, but also on the challenges of bringing about an activist archaeology of the present and adopting a stance of critical, and I emphasize critical, solidarity. 
Rather than, attempt, rather than attempting to represent the lives of the people on the move who live there in, Mor in Moria, it would mean to make effectively present, to sensorially evoke, the experiential realities of the border as a privileged locus of reflecting on racialized modernities and on colonialism and colonization as a present day on ongoing process. So in addition to doing archaeology of that context, I felt that studying the border as a material reality would provide us with the opportunity to reflect on racialized modernity today. So you know, you must know, you should know the well-known book, The Border as Method, by Mesadra and Nilsson. So the border as an opportunity for reflection on racialized modernity is my additional response. It also means to take this case as an opportunity to reflect on the peculiar conditions of contemporary ruination and explore the political affordances it engenders. So for the next few minutes, I'll show you a few slides of uh, the survey I conducted on the burnt camp of Moria in two uh, different occasions, in October 2020 and in uh, July 2021. Um, this is from the um, commanders in chief room where you can see in fact the board that the commander in chief used to record the numbers of people at Moria uh, per sector. And this is the last day, the day of the fire. So this is what we, we archeologists call a Pompeii moment. A moment when um, things uh, stood still, a moment of freezing, a moment where you have um, a snapshot of what happened that day. That day you had a total of 12,768 people. We know that this is a, a false number, of course, but this is what the commander in chief thought. It gave him a sense of satisfaction to know that everybody's accounted to the last one. We also have um, under departures from Moria and Astanatos one day. Um, Fragments from uh, interviews that people uh, gave to various uh, agencies and authorities, uh, written in paper and then stored in files that they were never actually rescued or transported to a new locality and they were left on the ground for everybody to see um, a few weeks after the fire. Um, the facade of the asylum building uh, with the cordon sanitaire between the outside and the inside of that building and the little opening where you had to put your hand with your papers to reach the staff members of the asylum building. The mat materiality of humanitarianism with um, the inscriptions of uh, various organizations, in this case the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and the Samaritan Spurs. And of course, the materiality of the early life of the camp. The camp used to be um, a, a conscripts training camp, as you know. And you can still see the, um, the guard posts uh, in the corner here, and then the new materiality was produced when the camp was reorganized as a, as a migrant facility. Um, a photo that I find astonishing in the sense that you have uh, um, a cement drum that imitates and cites a classical column and in the background you see the so-called prokeka or the pre-departure um, detention facility for aliens. Basically the prison that people were put to after rejection or sometimes preemptively when they, it was felt by the authorities that they could not get asylum or they are prone to criminality. It was of course illegal, but it happened as we know in Moria. So having those two together, having the citation of classical antiquity on the foreground and the prison of mi for migrants in the background, I think speak volumes for this specific locale, but also for the long histories of, of, um, of colonization, I would say. And recall also how the, the inmates at Macronistos were also building imitations of the classical monument. The open air cinema of Moria, um, a copy of Robis Robinson Crusoe's book. Uh, what was left of an iron after the fire? What was left of the soles of shoes? <laughs> 
And one of the many tanurs, tanurs are Middle Eastern uh, sunken ovens for preparing bread, preparing roti um, bread. Several people, especially from Afghanistan, built those um, ovens at Moria, even if they were to stay there for a few weeks or months. It was important for them to create these specific facilities and build the bread that they wanted to eat. So um, they, um, they were recording by, by myself several times over. Uh, and here you see the remnants of the art studio. The art studio that I had actually seen and photographed earlier by two of my friends, Afghani friends, uh, um, Lida um, and Shukran, they were both painters. They are now in France. But this is what was left of their studio after the fire. And the um, COVID clinic that uh, was being built as the fire uh, was raging, and we know that COVID um, was one of the kind of factors in the fire. Um, yeah, so these are some, 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 some of um, kind of visual uh, impressions of that kind of project of recording. Now, Derek Walcott, the um, well-known author, in 1954, um, in a poem, The Ruins of a Great House, says, the road remains with us, the men are gone. A poem that speaks to us in many voices, but not all that remains is rot. In this project, material traces that are deemed either rubbish, pollution that needs to be cleared away, and I know and we know that there are plans to do great things at Moria. The breeze that stands metonymically for the border crosser herself as rubbish, or at best treated as irrelevant, worthless, suspended by oral accounts, are here in this attempt, in this project, valorized as epistemic, archival, mnemonic, and affective entities as part of the flesh of the world. More than ruins, they are remnants or the remains of a racialized sensorial assemblage, the assemblage of the border. And yet they are more than that. What makes the means such a powerful concept, however, beyond their evocation of resilience, remains, I am still here, resilience and resistance, they make the effects of ab abstract policies, practices and logics, material and tangible. We all know the policies, but if we touch the remnant of a policy, I think we have a more direct experience of that, that abstract policy. Remains focus and soil attention. They invite and allow for a close examination. The author has the possibility to observe or rather to experience multisensorially things from up close. In this case, they enable us to understand the materially expressed logics of securitization, segregation, and biopolitical control. But also they invite us to appreciate the craft and labor that went into migrant world making, into shaping materially a parallel life, into enacting an affirmative biopolitics. And here I'm uh, evoking a concept by Roberto Esposito, affirmative, affirmative biopolitics. So you saw the labor that went into reshaping the camp, especially in its last, last phase, especially in the early 20s, 2020s, when the numbers exceeded 20,000, and it was clear to the people that the authorities could not really cope any longer. At that moment, it was the migrants themselves that took over in building their own facilities to cope with that, uh, that, um, that situation. And you can appreciate not only the materiality of segregation, but also that labor and craft that went into art studios, into um, bread ovens, into school, um, school classrooms, and other things. So it is, these, are, these are all important, I think, in political eff efficacious. But there is more to the concept of remains that takes us from politics to ontology and back. I'm thinking of remains as both presence and absence. And evoking here Jacques Derrida in his Spectres of Marx as material traces that enact an ontological state of haunting. Uh, Derrida calls it hauntology, merging the words haunting and ontology. A state that entails perhaps at the starting point 
the affect of mourning, and as we know, mourning is central also in the thinking of the in relation to ontology. As we're walking amongst the remnants of Moria, we're mourning a half absent and half present world, which we had experienced and I had experienced as living. So I was enacting mourning as photography when I was taking these photos, knowing too well that even the remains I was photographing would soon be scattered and drastically transformed. But the ontological state of haunting enacted by remains is also and perhaps primarily about temporality. Haunting is historical but not dated, says again Derrida, citing time and again the well-known Shakespearean phrase, time is out of joint. And while he himself chose not to take this direction further, I would propose here today following uh, Bergson that um, remains suspended between absence and presence, between life and death, enact time as duration. They constitute material memories in the pure sense, memories not as recollections, but as materializations of multi-temporality as past moments and episodes that live on in the fragile consensus we call the present. As such, they are full of haunting potential. Now, another term you may want to think about is, we want to think about is survivance. Survivance is another term that comes to mind, combining survivals and resistance. A term that more, more recent years has been associated with the writings and struggles of Native American intellectuals who also enact survivance. They are still here despite, despite what happened um, in the United States and in all kind of colonized places. It is also a term discussed by Derrida himself in his last interview before his death, a term that according to him denotes the most intense life possible. Another term you would think, uh, we could think is residence time. And it was introduced this time by Christina Sharp, the African-American intellectual and scholar, to speak of the enslaved Africans who perished in the Middle Passage, but whose remnants, Christina Sharp says, are still with us in the wake, the expression she uses in the title of her book is in the wake, as atmospheric elements. Resi residual time would be another term, as durational time of remains as residues, as components of assemblages no longer in operation, components which can potentially form new assemblages. And here again, I'm using uh, the term assemblage in the Deleuzean sense, the sense of um, the coherence of heterogeneous elements that give rise to new emergencies. Rather than being archival entities for conventional sense, rather than being domicile in the archeon, the set of the archon of the authority, these remnants as photographs and as new objects I've collected and I have collected um, selectively a few objects from the burnt camp are rather unhoused remnants on the move under my conditional and temporary stewardship. They can be reactivated in multiple other locations beyond the burnt camp of Moria itself. Here in this room, for example, through the projection I showed you, or in an exhibition we uh, put together at Brown University called uh, Transit Matter, Assemblages of Migration in the Mediterranean. Um, you can see the online version of it still um, as part of the Hathor Refer Museum of Anthropology. While one could say that all matter embodies and enacts durational time, remains as both presence and absence combine durational time with ontology. Let us return to Moria for a second and its haunted remnants of migration. They are the remnants of a border assemblage at the fault line between the global north and the global south. And this is something that we haven't actually explored further, that the border between the Lesbos Islands and all the islands and Turkey is not just a Greek-Turkish border, it's also a border between the global north and the global south, in effect. The specters of colonialism, of racial modernity and its buffer states, and here we have two buffer states, both Greece and Turkey, loom large amongst these remains. Both countries were and are funded lavishly, as we know, from the, by the European Union to stop people on the move from reaching the core of Western Europe. 
uh, I'm reminded again of Christina Sharp's coupling of transatlantic slavery and its haunted presence with the migrant seed crossings from Africa to Europe. And Christina actually uses both um, narratives and both kind of examples in the same book. And it's great that she does that connection. And along with it, I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking of a movie of a film that you may have seen by Mati Diop, 2019, called Atlantic, in which the people who embark on a sea voyage from Senegal to Spain, 948 nautical miles, and they were perished in the process, return, return to Senegal to hone the living and to demand justice. The burned remains of Moria speak of the haunting return of the colonies. Burned remains, and I want to reflect on burning for a second. Are the remnant, the, sorry, the migrants from North Africa to Europe also not called haragas? Haragas from an Arabic word from, for the burned one, hagir or haraga. So why the burned ones? Haragas because they often burn their papers as they claim a new identity vis-a-vis -vis the state. Haragas because they burn their previous lives as they reinvent themselves. Haragas because they are sacrificing themselves for the ones left behind. Haragas because some of them burn their fingertips, that's another strategy as we know, to avoid biometric capturing and detection. All of them, perhaps. This haunting, the necessary ghosts that need to be recalled through these remnants in order to unsettle us and remind us of our own complicity with the contemporary border regimes, are also essential for another reason. They make sure that the activation of such remnants through photographic proxies, in occasions such as this one, do not engender the usual affects of what we call ruin lust, sometimes also ruin porn, which as Susan Stewart, a specialist on ruins, remind us, comes from a feeling of self-comfort. The thrill of danger, the proximity, but only photographic proximity to disaster, experienced from a sensorially and experientially safe distance. We are here safe and we are seeing through photographs um, the remnants of a disaster. But remains as hauntology are also about the future. The future is always experienced as haunting, says uh, Mark Fisher. The haunted remains of Moria may conjure up the ghosts of racial and colonial modernity in its bordering practices, as well as the continuous resistance to them, but they also conjure up the specter of different futures. Hondology as virtuality, as alternative potential histories. Now, the remains of Moria conjure, conjure up the specter of the future camp, a future camp regime with stricter surveillance and containment. And as we know, that future has come already, both in the so-called Moria II um, on your left here, um, but also in the camp that is being uh, currently built uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, a prison, in fact, um, which is going to make it impossible for us to come into contact with the people in prison there and for them to come into contact with the society of Mytilini or any, uh, any other kind of collectivity. So that regime is already um, in, um, in, in effect in a reality here. But these uh, same remnants conjure up alternative future possibilities. After all, these remnants I show you from Moria are the results of a huge fire event which was allowed to burn for days, as we know. There were other fire episodes at, at the camp previously, but only destroyed part of the camp and it was put out very, very, very fast. This last one was allowed to burn and burn, perhaps because it was accepted by both authorities and migrants alike that the camp was no longer livable that it needed to be burned. These remnants, as remnants with their haunting presence, remind us of the fragility of the border apparatus and of the potential for its nomadic inhabitants to reshape it. And this is from the major uprising of 2017. Some of you may have heard of the Moria 30 who were captured, who were uh, arrested after this major uprising, mostly by African migrants. Um, 
which was actually, of course, crushed uh, by the riot police, by the mats. Um, so I will try to uh, be brief for um, the next few minutes and uh, wrap up. This was the first paradigmatic shift, which is about chronopolitics and the break with linearity. The second is to do with body politics and um, the body politics of modernist archaeology. By that, I mean the reliance of Western modernist archaeology upon the conception of a bounded, autonomous, individuated body, more often than not the male body, as we know, and one which operates within the Western sensorium of the five senses, seeing mostly as separate modalities, separate senses, as organic and biological processes. And the story goes that external stimuli are in internally processed and um, thought through the mind, resulting in the responses of the body. Of course, it is a Cartesian body politic, um, which is also responsible for the vision-oriented heritage of modernist archaeology and of modernity in general. And its elevation, the sense of vision being elevated into the supreme sense. Bodily and sensorial hierarchies are often mapped into gender and racial hierarchies, as we know, while at the same time certain senses are seen as features and attitudes of animality. There were discourses in modernity that certain uh, senses are animalizing senses, the sense of touch, for example, or, um, other sense, as opposed to the intellectual sense of vision or hearing. In my Archaeology and the Senses book, I have developed a proposal for a multisensorial and synesthetic understanding of the senses and have advocated for the importance of affect as a shared space, as a sensorial field, as a space in between, where emotions are collectively generated and felt. And I've also argued for the sense of transcorporeality, uh, a concept that in philosophy has been associated with Spinoza and with other Spinozian and Deleuzean philosophers, but for me, extremely important in thinking beyond the individuated body of Western modernity. Finally, the third paradigmatic shift which is needed has needs to be done is about storytelling, about narration, about developmental narratives of archaeology as narration. For many years, we know that storytelling about the human past is, was based, is still based, on cultural evolutionist framework, on a developmental sequence from bands to tribes to chiefdoms to states to modernity which is a fiction, in fact, um, of specific archaeological and anthropological models. There is no empirical validation for that developmental sequence of human history. Data were accumulating for years, and uh, for decades, about that kind of statement, that that developmental understanding of history is actually wrong. These fictions project a linear developmental story, a march of progress towards complexity, towards sophistication, ending, of course, with Western modernity and Western democracy, at which point progress stops. Because we reached the best possible world. That's the story we've been told, as you know. Now, data that expose these fallacies were all over the archaeological and anthropological literature from decades. Data that showed, for example, that thousands, for thousands of years, people were experimenting with plants and animals, and they still do, prior to the establishment of what we call agriculture. Or that population increase does not necessarily lead to a centralized authority and hierarchical government. As we also know, uh, the book that was published only a couple of years ago, and in Greek, I think a few months ago, the book by David Greber and David Wengro, the dawn of everything, a new history of humanity, is perhaps the most recent and best attempt to gather such a rich body of archaeological and anthropological data, as well as indigenous thinking and accounts, and propose a simple argument. The argument of the book is very, very simple, in fact. That a different, non teleological narrative about the past, an open-ended story of humanity, is not only empirically grounded, but also liberating. If there are so many and diverse forms of social organization, material life in the past, if there is no predetermined path, things could, sti could, could still be otherwise. Things could still be different. There are, of course, problems with that book as well. Um, it is mostly a book that doesn't engage with material memory and with chronopolitics. 
um, and also with sensoriality on the body, it is also an anthropocentric book. It is a book that despite championing indigenous thinking, the lessons of multi-species thinking have not been taken up. And for me, that's a criticism I have actually um, posed in print to uh, David Wengro, the surviving of the two authors, as we know. So we're going to conclude, because I've spoken, I think, far too long. So um, a quotation. The realization of freedom is a problem of time. <laughs> this quotation uh, is by actually Herbert Marcuse in 1957. And although in this case he meant it in terms of capitalist relationships, it can also apply to the perception, understanding, and management of different temporalities and temporal regimes. In my lecture today, I have claimed that the politics of time and the politics of the body and the senses and the politics of story storytelling, all three different kinds of politics and narration, are fundamental in working towards the liberation and emancipation of collect and collective freedom. I've also claimed that remnants of various times as material memories are at the center of these politics of time, body, and narration. But for them to be activated, however, we'll need an archaeological sensibility attuned to these sensorial chronopolitics and sensorial chronopoetics of matter, as well as the haunting that material remnants harbor and activate. In the fragile consensus we call the present, haunting is the only ontology of ethical and political living possible. And I'll stop here and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Yanni, for this very interesting talk. Uh, before we take advantage of our position <laughs> as, <laughs> as moderators, uh, are there any questions or thoughts or observations from you? Um, can we have the microphone, please? We need to use a microphone for the recording, sorry. I think it's a good I think it's a good, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. So I think it's a good thing that I'm going first because my question is an undergrad kind of question. At some point early on in your lecture, uh, you differentiated between uh, coloniality and colonialism, I think, and you were pretty firm about this distinction. So I, I, I just wanted to ask how do you understand it and if, if there is any theory or theorists you're drawing from, uh, because you've been very generous with your quotations, so I'm, I'm sure there's more to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a great, you know, I, I'm aware that there was a lot there that I didn't, didn't elaborate on and didn't explore. So yes, I was firm about the, the, the distinction because I think we often um, confuse it. And when we talk, for, for example, about coloniality in a place like Greece, we say, but why, what, why is it relevant? Greece was never formally colonized as a country. Greece is not Indian, India. Greece is not kind of uh, the various African countries. And I'm saying, but coloniality is, um, is the epistemic, social and political regime that enable the historical process of colonization to take place. Well, no, it's 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 coloniality is is, is kind of uh, you call it mentality. I would use different terms. I would call it a frame of thinking and a regime in terms of, for example, hierarchies, in terms of the you know white superiority, for example, in terms of establishing racialized kind of sense of of life and of humans. So white supremacy was epistemically grounded first and established first before the world was fully colonized with different power by different powers from the global north. So in terms of theoreticians, yes, there are plenty of people who have written about it. The, col the colonial school of thinking often cites South American scholars such as Manuel, um, sorry, uh, but, uh, such as um, Minolio, but, uh, Mino yeah, Walter Minolio, but I prefer to think of um, Caribbean thinkings, including Sylvia Winter, for example, who spoke spoken extensively about that process of coloniality 
because she combines, you know, for example, uh, the patriarchal, um, the patriarchal kind of heritage of coloniality as well as the racial heritage of coloniality. And she's, she and others speak of genes of a human, um, again, arguing against the universal subject of a human as somebody that, you know, is a constant and a standard kind of in, in world history. And there are many, 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 many more we can, we can uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you, as an yeah. archaeology student uh, myself, about yeah. the current uh, cultural coloniality in Greece, about the international schools excavations in various sites. Yeah. Mm. What was your opinion about that, mm. in, especially in a period of decline the interest of NGF history, especially? Mm. Yeah, again, a very good question. Uh, uh, we are discussing extensively, extensively, you know, it's a small book, you know, we're discussing at some length the issue of um, foreign archaeological schools in, in the book Archaeology Nation Arrays. Um, we avoid in that book a kind of a simple binary between colonizer and colonized because the case of Greece and many, you know, the cases of colonization are extremely complicated. And what we are saying is that Greece as a formation and as a buffer state and as a nation state has in fact operated um, as a colonized entity and country as well as a colonizer as a national state. And we can think of histories of colonization um, starting with Northern Greece, uh, thinking about Asia Minor, thinking about Anatolia, where you do have archaeological colonization as well as political and social colonization. Um, the story of Asia Minor is an extremely interesting one because you also have a story of direct and specific archaeological colonization. There was an archaeological service that actually went, was embedded fully within the structures of the army and worked side by side with the invading Greek army in, in Anatolia. They were deploying prisoners of war to carry out excavations. Some of the, uh, those kind of traces, some of those objects found in excavations in Anatolia were brought here and they are still in the National Museum. So um, all this to say that it is um, simplistic to treat a nation state such as Greece as simply and purely a colonized state and somebody else colonizer. Now, the foreign ecological schools equally are complicated entities. They need to be understood as such. They definitely express a legacy of colonization, but at the same time, they operate in different ways today. For example, for the Greek archaeological community, they um, enable archaeological work to happen very often because the state apparatus cannot, as we know, often cope with, with supporting archaeological work, for example, through archaeological libraries. And many of us who use these libraries know how important they are for our work. Um, the archaeologist Antoni Zoi several years ago said that the foreign schools in Greece are like the, um, the hospitals of tropical diseases in colonized countries. And by that he meant that, you know, they're, you know, they it's better if we don't have them, but they operate, if they form, if they perform a function, they operate in such a way as it becomes beneficial for the archaeological community of the country as well. Now, having said that, they are in dire need for decolonization themselves. They're in dire need of their communities to, un to acknowledge that heritage of colonization and take steps at decolonizing themselves. Some directors and some staff in those schools from time to time do engage in those acts, for example, in hosting conferences to do it, but those initiatives are very, very few and far in between. So I consider them as one component in the whole assemblage of archaeology in Greece. So the whole assemblage needs to be, you know, rethought, reconstituted, reinvented, including the archaeological, the foreign archaeological schools. We could say more, but I hope I had enough. I was wondering if uh, your concept of materialities mm -hmm. and the material memory concept is connected to it. Yeah. Uh, if there is a literature that actually takes into account the difference between ancient, pre-modern, 
and modern capitalist materialities, which are being defined and overwhelmed by the fact uh -huh. that we have machines, and machines are black boxes. There's one part that is being displayed and one part that is being concealed. Mm. And this difference, mm. unavoidably, to, to the degree that we agree that when we talk about material memory, we talk about the present, we talk mm. about what arrives at the present, mm. means that the two different versions of materialities mm. are mixed. Mm. And to make the point more specific, in the case of Moria, for example, mm. we have materialities that, like the ones that you showed there, mm. but we also have missing materialities. For example, mm. the long distance ask acting materialities of digital infrastructures. You mentioned mm -hmm. biometrics in the, early in the figures, mm -hmm. but biometrics we now know through many technologies are actually linked to central European offices. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. And, and they are, what I'm trying to say is that they are not of the kind that, in a sense, we look at the surface, comparatively, comparatively speaking. There is a conceal element. Uh, it, it, it appears as conceal even at the point of the camp sometimes. Mm. To keep it short, there is, it's a different version of materiality. So I was wondering mm. if comparing the two and mm. taking into account this, if there is a literature or given ideas of how to actually incorporate this difference in the concept mm. of material memory. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, very, very interesting thoughts. Um, uh, when you mentioned the biometric um, infrastructure of Moria, I thought of a photo I took, unfortunately I don't have it in this PowerPoint presentation, of, uh, of a broken compact disc that I found, that I actually collected, and it was, I, I, it had a kind of a, um, a scribbled kind of name in which I looked it up, and it was a software company that produces software for biometric fingerprinting. So yes, there is that materiality, but even that materiality is visible, can it become visible even in those conditions. Uh, black boxing is an interesting concept. I'm thinking, um, are we talking about two fundamental kind of different kinds of materiality, the pre-modern and modern one, or are we talking about process of mystification that could be also encountered in pre-modern times? You know, some of the technology of prehistory, for example, could be a mystified technology to somebody who who is not aware of how specific tools work. You know, when, when I don't know, the first technologies of pottery making came to different kind of um, regimes and different, different regions that had no technology uh, pottery making, perhaps they saw that first technology as mystifying. But I do have a reference to suggest, and that's um, a book by my colleague, uh, Spanish colleague, um, Alfredo Ruibal, who has done a whole book on the materiality of modernity, and he emphasizes distraction. He says a key kind of facet in modernity, in what he calls hypermodernity, is distraction. But capitalism destroys, and, capital and mod capitalist modernity is engaged in large-scale distraction. So a lot of what we're seeing is a kind of constant process of producing and destroying, producing and destroying. So you have hyperabundance of materiality that's also, also destroyed very, very, very fast, and new materialities are being produced. You know, he compares the different sense of temporality, you know, prehistory, early history, and then modernity. So those differences I would consider important. Rate, acceleration. Um, in terms of the concealment or not, I'm not sure. I want to think about it, but thank you for the comment. <laughs> Actually, it would be useful for me if people identify themselves mostly in terms of background, so we know, you know, who are the people we're talking. So, okay. Uh, so, well, basically, I'm an accountant, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm, I may make a postgraduate on uh, yeah. politics. Mm. Uh, I want to take the focus a little bit away from materiality and archaeology and yeah. focus on something that you touched upon earlier. Yeah. Uh, about the about uh, what happened in 2020 after George Floyd's murder and the yeah. toppling of statues yes. yeah. uh, in the American South primarily because that's where most of the Confederate statues were. You saw the graph mm. uh, that showed that the erection of those of those statues yeah, was, was primarily again. in the early 1900s. So basically, yeah. it was towards the end of the Reconstruction era. Mm -hmm. which was uh, an era of um, intense, well, pain. I'm going to put it mm. in air quotes because mm. it wasn't actual pain. Uh, 
mm. but there was a lot of popular dissatisfaction in the South mm. for reconstruction because yeah. they saw it as an attempt yeah. uh, of the North to impose its values on them. Yes. And how it was uh, uh, this, um, and how, and how essentially this played out into their uh, continuous narrative of the lost cause of the Confederacy that is still alive today yeah, in far-right uh, mm -hmm. uh, movements in mm. the, uh, the US. Mm -hmm. And how basically it was uh, this continuous erection of uh, status yeah. in, the, in the, their attempt to memorialize their uh, past, the mm. memorialize their revolution against the mm. United States that essentially uh, strengthened and led to the creation of the Jim Crow uh, law mm. of laws, mm. which were passed a couple of decades mm. later and basically uh, reversed a lot of the progress that happened under the reconstruction yes. era yeah. and mm. further disenfranchised African Americans. Yeah. And how basically uh, this material reality of the status led to a political change. Of course, it was you mm. know, a regression towards the mm. past. Mm. And how possibly something of this nature could be utilized in reverse to lead to political change instead of towards a regression, mm. towards mm. the future, towards mm. a better situation for mm. humanity as a whole. Mm. Yeah, I think um, this is also my point. Um, I think I do not see a kind of a Disagreement? Is it a disagreement or is no, it a kind of a comment? No, it's not a disagreement. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you gave more context, which is great, and thank you. You seem to know American history pretty well. So that, I mean, I, I, I took this graph from a great organization called Southern Poverty Poverty yeah, Law, um, Law Center, which is, you know, gathers lots of interesting data. And the point here is that these statues are not, in fact, commemorations of the Civil War. They were made, they were mostly created at that moment, which you described. But also, look at the year um, 1909, which is the foundation of the National um, Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the main organization then for African Americans to mobilize around. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think, the point I was making, that these are not statues that they were put up to commemorate that event of the Civil War. There were statues that partici were participating at the time in a kind of, in a clash, in a conflict. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the, the material kind of correlates of the clash that you also described. And then it's interesting also to see another peak during the Civil Wars era, uh, sorry, the Civil Rights Movement era in the 1960s. When again, you see African Americans in the public arena, in the public sphere, being very, very vocal and demanding justice. And that was the moment when you also have more of those memorials being built. Yeah. Please, can we have the microphone? Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate. I have studied, soci studied social anthropology and political history. Okay. And uh, without any sense of provocation, I just wanted to ask, yeah. so uh, if we want to construct a certain ontology of concepts, we may see that we have uh, certain concepts, concepts such as uh, hegemony, the fusion mechanisms, how mm. an ideology or a concept is diffused in society. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering whether the concept of coloniality comes in terms with those other concepts. Um, are they debating? Are they uh, opposing concepts? I mm. find that uh, your concept, as you presented it, mm. I mean, of coloniality, it's very similar to that of hegemony. Mm. Whether we're talking you about... You mean in the, in the Gramscian sense, or...? Whether we're talking about uh, a neorealist concept of hegemony mm -hmm. or a Gramscian or a mm -hmm. neo-Marxist one, mm -hmm. I find that they are very similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we're going to talk about, for example, uh, the contemporary world, contemporary world, we may see that uh, there are many theorists trying to grasp the concept of the international and its exchanges mm -hmm. as an organic part of the national, the domestic level. Mm -hmm. So... While I'm not having any problem with the term coloniality, yeah. I just want to yeah. see whether it's mm. contrasting concepts are in opposing yeah. common yeah. terms. Yeah. Just it a comment on that. Thank you. 
No, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. I, I haven't done work on the concept of uh, hegemony, and as far as Gramsci is concerned, we have Panayotis Sutiris here, who is a great Gramscian scholar, so you can say more about it. But, but I wanted to stick with the concept of coloniality because for me, at least in the readings I have done, it actually um, is grounded on, on um, understanding the racialization of the, wor the world and the concept of race and the hierarchies of race are central in the concept of coloniality as I'm using it here. It may be the case that the concept of hegemony um, is something that can work really well together with the concept of coloniality in terms of how um, certain um, ideas um, about the world and the constitution of humanity actually become accepted, popularized, and become dominant. And in fact, ideas about white supremacy, which are central in the concept of coloniality, were, and I think still are dominant in many parts of the world, and also in the way we perceive the world today ourselves, and the way we, we act and behave as kind of um, racialized uh, beings. Most of us, I think, white, um, construed as white here. So um, my short answer, thank you. I need to think more about the connection between coloniality and hegemony, but I would love to hear other views on whether the two concepts can actually be complementary to each other or can, can, can work together. Yeah, I, if you. I may add something, Quijano's, Quijano's conceptualization in mm. the coloniality of power is something that is mm. um, a common ground mm. uh, between uh, what you two were mm. just discussing. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I mean, my question is, is rather simple. All the, all the work that you have done, not only now, but for mm. many years into this uh, idea of the plural mm. material temporalities inscribed yeah. in the, in the yeah. very notion of the archaeological monument, in what sense can they be put into practice, especially in the context of archaeology in Greece, where still battles are waged in the name of yeah. preserving yeah. A, a very specific conception yeah. okay. of the past. And I thought you were going to talk about Gramsci. That, 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 but no, no, okay. Gramsci, no, Gramsci, you're absolutely right. Mm. I think that I think that there is work being done on that. I mean, coloniality mm. is an integral aspect of, of capitalism. And of course, he said a lot about coloniality within Italy, right? Yeah, and, and the north and the sense, south. And in yeah. this sense, yes. The, yeah. If we're going to do research into, into yeah. how hegemony was formed, coloniality is is something that needs much more uh, yeah. elaboration. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Panayoti. Now, in terms of practice, I thought I showed some examples <laughs> from the work that's actually very, very practical in the sense that, for example, the, the other Acropolis project, is uh, it started as a photo blog, and it was a very, very simple photo blog. The idea was to photograph all that materiality of the Acropolis that is not projected in official accounts and narratives like the inscriptions, like the, um, the tombstones, like other things that are there if you actually look carefully and hard enough. So they are photographed and are put on the block and we invite everybody else, you know, artists and others to participate. It's a simple thing. It can be done if you have a blog, you know, address or something. But I think it's the beginning of doing what, you know, in theoretical terms, what Ranciere called the redistribution of the sensible, of creating visual images that are not part of the mainstream visual discourse about the Acropolis. The project on Mori, I think, is also a practical project in the sense that I had to spend lots of time there um, understanding that context and recording uh, things. And I'm still on working on what I have gathered and what, what is going to happen. But I think that the, these are practical measures of somebody who is not part of the uh, official archaeological structure of archaeology, right? I, I'm an academic working in a university outside Greece, and I, I do excavate here, and I had another part of the talk about my excavation of a Neolithic site, but we had no time to show. So when I'm here, what I do practically beyond those projects is to actually do work in my excavation in a way that would actually um, reconstitute the site of an excavation as something much more than a site of extracting 
data in the shape of artifacts in the shape of information. To give you an example, the site of Kutruluma Agura where we excavate has become a site of cultural production as well in the sense that we invite artists to do various things. We have a theater archaeology project that we stage there next to the trenches every year. And the community from the villages participate actively in that process. Uh, and in fact, ideas about multi-temporality come through that theater archaeology project because we constantly reference different times whether it's Neolithic time of finds from the trenches or the time of when the village of Neomonastiri, which is next to us, was built by migrants from Bulgaria in the 1920s or the time of our excavation. So practical things are happening, not just by myself, by many other colleagues. They are not embraced by the establishment of archaeology in Greece. Uh, but that's a, that's the usual kind of story of working against uh, 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 an established order in terms of legislation, uh, institutions, um, you know, all these kind of uh, components that form the assemblage of archaeology in Greece. And very often what we do is actually on the margins in terms of legislation or, you know, for example, Moria, I call it an archaeological site, but uh, <coughs> if you look at the legislation or definition of Archaeology in Greece, it's not an archaeological site. It's too recent to be considered archaeological. So the best thing you could do is just ignore the legislation, ignore uh, the official definitions, and do your thing. Do your work. <laughs> uh, Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so since you brought up uh, bureaucracy and the bureaucratic aspect of yeah. practicing archaeology in yeah. Greece, I'm not sure if you've done excavations or any other practical activities. I just said that uh, I'm doing for the last 10 years in an excavation on a Neolithic site in Thessaly, yeah? Oh, yeah. Anywhere outside Greece. I mean, ah. have you had any experience or have you been exposed to the bureaucratic understand the state understanding of archaeology to put it this way yeah. in other contexts where for instance yeah i think this brings us to the question if um, archaeology is a method or an ideology what makes uh, a medievalist different from an yeah. archaeologist yeah yeah um, i have briefly excavated in other parts in other countries but i have worked also in a country where archaeology is not a state affair so that country, for example, is the UK, where I spent so many, many years ago, uh, spent many years um, then teaching. And then the situation is different because archaeology is, a, is, a, is an affair of the heritage business and the heritage industry, which means that archaeology as, an activi as a field activity is carried out by private companies that are hired by the developer. And very often also people who ex they can excavate their garden on their own and they can keep lots of archaeological finds from there because the legislation is such that allows them to do so. Um, the developer funded archaeology in the heritage sector is a disaster in the sense that most of the things that are uncovered in a country like the UK are destroyed because the developer has no interest in, in preserving, in studying even, let alone, what, the only thing they want to do is to do a dig very, very, very fast, and they go out and they do what we call here myrtotikos diagonismos. So the lowest bidder gets the contract, does the dig very, very, very fast, and then the thing is destroyed for the airport or for the shopping mall to be built. So that's the kind of archaeology that's a non-state archaeology. <laughs> so I think what's needed is to, uh, for us to imagine structures that uh, would maintain the collective and the public character of archaeology, but without all the nationalist rhetoric that often comes from state ideologies. The, the, the bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy as well, yeah. Yeah. Are there any more questions, or can I ask my question? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I want to ask you because uh, uh, because you have worked in um, you have worked outside outside Greece, and uh, whether you have experience in uh, other countries like uh, like the U.S. or the, or Australia about 
how specifically uh, archaeology has been used to basically suppress evidence of indigenous cultures uh -huh, yeah. and to basically project an, an image that, well, there was nothing here before we came. We came, we created everything, so basically the indigenous inhabitants have no right to complain. Basically, you know, this whole notion that uh, it was just empty rolling fields and no one lived there because there was no official state, no, uh, no structured polity mm -hmm. uh, in the way that the Western world at least viewed it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, basically that's the question. Have you seen um, examples of uh, this uh, kind of marginalization of indigenous archaeological findings? Yeah, I mean, there, there are plenty, of course, and the literature is full of examples like the ones you described. I mean, the concept of terra nullius, that, you know, this is an empty land. It was central to colonization, as we know, not only in the Americas, in Australia, uh, in Palestine, uh, in many parts of Africa. Very often, colonizers, when they came across impressive material monuments and traces, they would think, uh, they would immediately propose and think that could not possibly be, let's say, African people or black people who created this civilization. The case of Grace Like the myth of Prester Zone. Of what, sorry? The myth of Prester Zone. Uh, it is basically a myth about uh, uh, some, uh, well, Christian and possibly white polity in uh, Eastern Africa that was populated yeah. in the Middle Ages because... Yeah, great. I was going to mention the Great, great Zimbabwe as an yeah. example. Great Zimbabwe is a, is a phenomenal um, site, um, archaeological site. The first interpret archaeological interpretation is that there were, there were people, white people from the Mediterranean, who came here and created these monuments here, of course. Uh, and of course, the country was named after the site and the monument to celebrate and commemorate indigenous culture in Africa. The same happened in West Africa when colonizers encountered Benin, Benin City, which is also a very impressive uh, medieval city. It's a you know, city. The, the, ben, the Benin, so-called Benin Bronzes come from. Again, the first interpretation of the British and the others were that these are not possibly the feats, the, the work of you know, indigenous African people. So there are plenty of examples to, to bring. There are also other examples that take even a more sinister um, kind of turn. For example, there are so many New Age and other explanations supposedly about the pyramids as the works of extraterrestrials. Again a, again, a racist argument that could not possibly be constructed by people in this African land, in this African continent. The story of archaeology in, in, in the US, in, in the Americas, in general, generally is a story of suppression of indigenous heritage. But what's happening at the moment, and for, for some years now, is that indigenous archaeology in a country like Australia or the US is actually a thriving field in the sense that indigenous communities have produced their own archaeology, both archaeologists who go into universities and get of degrees in archaeology as everybody else, but also archaeologists who combine a different ontology with academic skills and academic, uh, what we consider kind of the study skills of an archaeologist everywhere. So they do that, they get a degree in archaeology, but at the same time they bring to the, uh, on the table, they bring to kind of the archaeology cosmologies about the land, about memory, about traces that come from indigenous worldviews. And it happens extensively in the US, it happens also in South America. So I see hope in that sense. I see that what's happening in archaeology in countries like the US or South America, in Brazil, for example, or in Australia, is actually hopeful. Now, very often, my colleagues in Australia, every time they want to do archaeological work in a kind of in an area, they have to consult and take the permission of indigenous communities before they go and work. And very often the publications are shared publications between the archaeologist who wants to carry out work there and communities who collaborate actively and also assist and contribute in the interpretation. So we have to be hopeful a little bit too. And it's not are there any more questions? Giorgo, do you have questions? Well, I do have one last question then. Uh, in what you describe, like, you know, this 
paradigmatic shift, like you know, understanding the past not in linear terms, not in yeah. evolutionary terms. What are the resistance? What are the kind of like resistance and reactions you have met? Because I guess this is also, you know, decolonial thinking is everywhere within the university. Yeah. I don't think that this is th this goes, you know, without uh, resistance from mm. Mm. from you know from previous paradigms or from other disciplines. So what's yeah. the kind of like state of affairs in terms of like counter arguments or resistance to mm. what you're doing? Mm. Well, I mean, let's uh, let's take the uh, one of the examples I use. I use and imagine collectively here in this room the resistance and where it's coming from and why. Let's take the case of the Acropolis, right? Here is a proposal which I think is well supported empirically that the Acropolis is a multi-temporal site and not a fifth century BC monument, full stop, right? You can, you can bring so many, so many material kind of uh, arguments to support the case of the Acropolis as a multi-temporal site. But, as you say, there is huge resistance in accepting it, let alone in implementing a different kind of, call it management for a moment, different kind of uh, archaeological policy around the monument. So what are the resistance in the case of the Acropolis and, and, and the case of Greece? First of all, this hegemonic ideology about the national past, which recognizes the fifth century in classical antiquity as the foundation stone for the nation. So that's the, the first, and I think the most important. And then, of course, is the ecological specific you know, um, institutional resistance in terms of the managing of the site. The site of the Acropolis, as I said, is a modern site, is a modern monument that is managed very, very, very tightly by uh, an, an, uh, the apparatus of archaeology. And that management is geared towards A, projection of a national uh, narrative and a national story, and B, commodification. Yeah. yeah? Maximizing profit out of that specific site. And I think the, the cementing of the Acropolis is the merging of ideology and commodification, right? Ideology because Cores wanted to recreate supposedly the Acropolis of the fifth century, and commodification because the ministry felt great. You know, we can get more people here very, very fast, in and out. So you can see how these things kind of merge. So in this case, I think um, the answer is that we have complex, kind of a complex assemblage of kind of resistances, that some of them are ideological and some of them are practical in terms of commodification, but also practical in terms of legislation or museological uh, practices. Think of the Acropolis Museum. Why is it that people who go to the Acropolis Museum do not learn about all, you know, the other, si the other kind of lives of the monument? Why don't they learn about the Ottoman Acropolis? Why that inscription I show you is not in the Museum of the Acropolis and it, nobody knows where it is at the moment? It may, huh? It's in the old museum. Yeah, I, I thought so, but you know, uh, I couldn't prove it because I haven't. Um, so, uh, the ideology of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the Acropolis as a national monument and a monument of the fifth century is the ideology that that museum also follows. So, it's called the, muse the Acropolis Museum, but that, of course, is a false title for the museum because it is uh, the museum for the classical periods of the Acropolis as imagined by the Greek states. <laughs> it's a long title, but perhaps they should, you know. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? Yes, Nico. Nico. Yeah. Can uh, we get the microphone? I know you have a loud voice, but it's for the recording. <laughs> Okay, very, very short one. Yeah. So, do you believe that this entire decolonizing process can be still, can be yet, can be again an anti-colonial agenda or is it something of the past? Is it something that we just, um, mm. um, are we you know, breaking down the past or we are just finding some space for us to, to live more comfortably? Uh, you know, like the mm. big, uh, yeah, I, I am not sure I understand the question. So, is it about um, anti-coloniality versus decoloniality? Yeah. So do you, I mean, do you see it? How do you define yourself anti-coloniality in this case? I mean, can you say yeah, a bit more? I, I would say that uh, anti-colonial is more something of the past. That it, it meant a direct 
and, 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 and uh, imminent collapse of colonial authority as, as it stood, um, as it's expressed. In the sense of the collapse of the yes. empires of yes, the global north? Of yeah. And then, uh, in today, we are struggling with colonial mm. legacies, mm. we call them, or colonial uh, mm. ethos that mm. is everywhere around us. Mm. But um, it seems sometimes mm. that we are stuck in this middle mm. space mm. Of, 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 you know, like, that we can just push away this kind of ideas without uh, mm. real change. No, uh, yeah, okay. okay. Um, yeah, a complex question, and I think, um, First of all, the whole school of decolonial thinking, as I understand it, was a reaction to the notion that decolonization was something of the past, and that's over. We've done that, let's move forward. That was, in fact, the starting point of the whole discussion, that coloniality is an ongoing process, that the historical process of decolonization in the simply in the political and historical process of collapse, first of all, there are empires haven't collapsed yet, you know, the French Empire is still present. There are still kind of overseas territories managed by France for a start. You know, and the legacy of the British Empire is still alive in many parts of the world. So I, even in the practical sense, in terms of the complete collapse of the imperial regime of those empires, we are not there yet. But more importantly, in terms of coloniality as an epistemic project as well, as a kind of a project of ideas and hierarchies, that's definitely ongoing and still alive. Uh, and that's why the coloniality keeps saying that it's a, it's a, a struggle that is, has to be ongoing, has to continue. Um, in terms of what I think um, is going to happen, I am an eternal optimist, and I think that things are changing and things are happening, but this is a continuous process of pushing against in, uh, uh, in every kind of, in every possible um, context, in every possible uh, place where practice of coloniality are being enacted. I do, I have seen how archaeologists, archaeology, for example, has changed in the last 20 years, how uh, the way we do archaeology, now as I said, I mean, in, in vis a vis the colonization of the global south, has changed a lot. I'm not saying that everything is fine. I'm saying that I, 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 see, I see that we are doing some things better. Any other questions? Well, if uh, we don't have further questions, please join me in thanking Yanis Hamilakis. Thank you. And if I may say something more, we've got a seminar coming up next Friday. We'll have with us Sarah Ferris, uh, the feminist scholar who has introduced terms like feminationalism and homonationalism, who is going to talk to us um, about feminism from the kitchen floor. On domestic workers erased feminism, that's next Friday on the 2nd of June at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.